Part 1 You will hear a science student inquiring about English courses at a university language centre. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 7. Hi, I've come to ask about the English courses you run for international students. Oh, right. I assume you're a student at the university. Yes, I've just started. Okay, well, we've got a range of courses. It depends what you think you need and how much. Oh. Um, we can't run everything at the same time, though. So, for example, in this first term, we are just doing a writing course. I see. That sounds quite useful. What else is there? Um, some of the courses only run for single terms, and we tend to focus on what students have difficulty with. That mm -hmm. means we don't usually do speaking courses, but next term you can do listening. Oh. That'll help you with lectures and things. Our provision is all based on what the majority of our international students need. So, is everything term-based? There's nothing that you run all year? Well, let's have a look. Yes, there is a class for vocabulary and grammar every term. That's for everybody, but it's split into three or four levels. And what about in the holidays? We don't do anything during the winter or spring break. Oh. But over the summer, there's just general classes because that's what most students want. Mm. A bit of everything. Mm -hmm. OK, quite a variety then. Mm. I'll uh, have a think about what I really need because I haven't got much time. Do you have about 20 students in each class, the same as our science seminars? We try to keep it at about 12 and certainly not more than 15. Mm -hmm. It's important for language classes. They're very different from your normal courses. Right. And how much are the classes? The rate varies depending on how many hours you attend, but you shouldn't have to pay. Usually, the department will fund you and even sort out which classes you need. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> it would be quite useful for me to have a certificate to take back to my country. Do you put us in for exams? Yes, but we don't like them to clash with your main course exams in June, so we run them in May. Oh. That leaves you time for revision. Do I have to sign up for something now? I'm not quite sure what I want. Classes haven't quite started yet, so you've got time to decide what you do. All we insist is that you sign up before week five. That gives you about three weeks to decide. OK. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 8 to 10. Then, when you've made up your mind, you need to come back here to the administration office to enroll. What do I need to bring with me when I enroll? My identity card, I guess? Yes, or your passport. Uh -huh. Then you'll be given a registration form, which you'll have to show to the teacher when you have your first class. OK. And um, should I ask my tutor about which classes I should do then? Yes. Then you get a note from him and give that to the desk when you register. Can I use the computers here as well? Yes. You'll be given a password when you go to your first class. So remember to bring a disk with you to save your work on, as you won't be allowed to save it on the hard drive. OK. Will I need anything else? Dictionary? We've got loads of those here that you can borrow. But you'll need a notebook as we don't provide paper or files. OK. Thanks.
That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a man giving some information about transport in London. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 11 to 15. Hello, can I help you? Oh yes, I was wondering what the best way was for me to get around London. Well, there are a lot of possibilities. As you probably realise, the main ways to get around are bus, train and tube. Oh? The underground. Oh. It depends how much you want to spend. Mm. All forms of transport offer special tickets, such as cheap day returns on the trains and so on. Overall, you'll spend less on the bus as it operates on a basic flat fare for each journey. Mm -hmm. But of course, it may not go to where you need to travel to. Oh. The mainline trains only operate in the outlying areas, though a few cross London, whereas the Tube has stations which are placed in central areas of the city, close to the main sites and shops. Mm. Obviously, there are more bus stops... Uh, but you will probably have to change buses to get where you want, which can be inconvenient. <sighs> you will find that the buses are mainly in the central areas, but some tube lines go quite a long way out of London, so you could use this for longer journeys. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the tubes do get very crowded, so you should use the train if you want to sit down. <sighs> it does depend where you're travelling to. Well, I'm living on the outskirts, but I have to travel into London to college every day and then around London when I'm here. Mm. OK, so time is going to be an issue for you. Mm. The Tube should be fast crossing London, but quite honestly, there are so many delays that it's not very efficient. Again, the train has fewer stops, so is probably your quickest option to get to and from college. <sighs> of course, which service you use might depend on how frequent it is. I mean, the trains might only be every 20 minutes or whatever, but a timetable is published to save you hanging around. Oh. There are a lot of tube trains at busy times of day, but fewer at other times whereas the buses run every five minutes through most of the day, and there are night buses. But you'll need to check out your route first. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 16 to 20. OK, thanks. How can I get from here to Hackney, then?
Right, well, you can choose. Uh, we're here at the information office, OK? Uh, now, next to us, on the corner of the High Street and Sweet Street, is the bus stop, opposite the bank. Uh -huh. The bus goes all the way to Hackney, but it is a very indirect route, so it could take ages. Uh. If you want to take the train, walk down the High Street towards the city. Go past the bank, and on your left is the station just before you get to the post office. Mm. There's a mainline service to Hackney Wick, so if you need to get into the centre of Hackney, you may need to pick up a bus when you get there. Mm. Opposite the post office, on the corner of Hart Lane, is the tube entrance. You'll see the big signs. That's probably the best way to get there, though you may have to change. It's probably best if you go and get a travel card first. <sighs> To get to the ticket office, you go out of here onto the High Street. Then turn into South Street, and the ticket office is on your right opposite the cinema. Mm. Of course, you may decide it's quicker to take a taxi. <laughs> but it's a long way, so I think it'll be very expensive. If you do want to get a cab, then the rank is outside here, just opposite the office. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two medical students, Caitlin and Hideki, discussing options for courses. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 21 to 23. Hi, Hideki. How are you? Fine. I'm glad I bumped into you. Have you got five minutes to sit down and discuss our extra course options for next term? Yes, yeah, sure. You mean the support courses for our modules? Yes. We've got three choices, and I'm not sure which would be best for us to do. Let's have a look. Um, yeah, we could do science and ethics... Sounds quite interesting. Yes, but I think we should be thinking what we get out of each course. Mm. So, science and ethics. There's a lot of reading and research to do. And I don't think it comes up in the exams, does it? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, oh, I see we have to do assignments and we get our score from that. But what it would do is to force us to get better at doing essays and reports, you know, organizing them and using the right kind of language. Mm. Might be worthwhile. Yeah, you're right. An alternative is the pharmacology prelim course. Oh. I think it's in case we want to go on to transfer to pharmacology at the end of the year, because lots of students do. Mm -hmm. So it depends what we want to do in the future. But apparently... They send you off to find out about various companies and the differences between their products. It would give you lots of practice in investigative studies and analysis. I think I'd quite enjoy that. Yes, I see your point. Um, then the other option is reporting test results. Sounds a bit boring. Not sure why they have a separate course just for that. Well, I could certainly do with some help in that. Because if you go out into industry, that's what you'll spend most of your time doing. Mm. So it's got a very practical application. Mm -hmm. 
I think I'm going to go for pharmacology. Me too. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 24 to 30. So, let's have a look at it in more detail. Oh, goodness. If we do pharmacology, then we have to do a supplementary maths course. Oh, no, that's not fair. Mm. Mind you, I think I need it. <laughs> Does that mean we have twice as many lectures? No. This maths is only a short course. The chemistry department are responsible, and they do it in the third term. So, we've got all next term to settle into the pharmacology bit. Oh, I find the tutor makes a real difference. Some of them make chemistry so easy, and some of them I can't understand at all. Like that one we had from Oxford University. Oh. <laughs> Mind you, the one on this course should make sense, because he's a lecturer who's coming in for a few weeks from industry. So, at least it'll be linked to the real world. <laughs> yeah. The project we have to do on this pharmacology course is huge, and it doesn't give us much time. We have to make a decision about what we want to do on the project as soon as we start in January, and then hand in our plans before the end of the month. Doesn't give us much time to sort out what's possible or not. Mm. I mean, doesn't the scale of our project depend on what resources we can have, like what equipment we can use? I suppose so, though I think there's plenty available. For example, it says that if we need to do any experiments, then we can use all the equipment in the new lab, as long as we book it. Oh, OK. It's slowly beginning to take shape for me. I think it'll be a good course. I'm just worried that I get enough support to do it. Huh. I think you'll be OK. And the tutors are always available if you get stuck. Oh, actually, it says that if you're not sure, then in December, they'll be running one or two additional seminars. So I might go to those. Actually, what's quite interesting is that at the end of the course, when our project is completed, then we have to do a presentation on it. Oh. I think that's quite good practice. Oh, a bit scary, though. <laughs> well... It shouldn't be too bad, as they say that we can do it in pairs. Oh. Spread the load, as it were. <laughs> oh, good. I have done presentations before, but I'm always very nervous. And is the presentation what we're assessed on, then? Let me look. Um... Ah, it says that we have an interview and we get a mark for the whole course, depending on how well we do in that. Oh, right. OK. So I... That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a lecture on cities of the future. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 40.
Okay, we've been looking at how societies will develop in the future and at the increase in the size of cities. So I want to talk to you today about the key considerations in these cities of the future. There are three key elements I want to look at, and these are the new features they will have, issues of size, and the main problems to be considered. First of all, individual transportation will be a big factor in these new megacities as public transport becomes unmanageable. There'll be a huge rise in the use of segways, which are personal transporters, like motorized scooters. As a result, and partly also to reduce pollution, roads will be altered so that they are narrower and will take up less of a city's space than they do currently. Naturally, this is a major change to the infrastructure, and something that may hinder it is the huge amount of investment it will require. The next thing is, what is going to happen to the commercial areas? We do not want these to become even larger concrete jungles than they are at present, so we have to look at design. And current designs for city development include building gardens on the roofs of these buildings to make a more pleasant environment for workers. And you may think that these areas will expand to cope with increased commercial activity. In fact, the prediction is that they will cover one-fifth of the area that they do at present as we build upwards. The exception to this is shopping centres, which we predict will expand with more and more temperature-controlled malls. What may cause difficulties is that the superstores will be confined to the outer edges of the city, as they will be too big to fit into the new malls. Then, of course, there are the residential areas, and these will undergo their own changes. One particular development will be houses which are built from glass, as innovations in this material allow it to provide light without causing problems with temperature inside a building. The residential areas will not be allowed to expand without limit, as happens in some areas at present, and their size will be restricted to a population of 15,000. One issue, which has yet to be resolved, and I'm not sure it ever will be, is how we manage to house older residents. They will be increasing in numbers as time goes on. Finally, how will these cities live? We know we have limited energy sources, so what will we do? Well, something currently in development, which will be a feature, is that waste is going to become an energy source. For example, to provide gas in homes. Also, as new technology and systems are developed, we will find that energy plants will become smaller. Another energy source we could use, but one which raises issues of having enough space and too much noise, is wind farms. Because of the problems, I'm not convinced these will be the grand solution to our energy problems that we thought they were going to be. Now, moving on to looking at the social aspect of cities, we need to look at housing and how people will live. Cities currently have flats in the centre, populated by single people and wealthier residents, and families tend to move to the outskirts. In the future, the centre of cities will see a dramatic change. We will see many more examples of cooperative buildings. This is where people join together to form a company that owns the building they live in. And despite continuing shortages, there will also be a rise in the provision of retirement homes in city centres so that the elderly can have easy access to hospitals and shops. Recently, we have seen a levelling off in the growth of private housing, and I think that will not change. But we are likely to see more social housing, as far fewer people will be able to afford to own their own homes. OK, now, if anybody has... Any
That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. The ILTS reading test is crucial for anyone aspiring to study or work in an English-speaking environment. A high score, especially a band 9, demonstrates your proficiency in understanding complex written English. This is essential for academic success and professional growth. Whether you're applying to universities or seeking global career opportunities, a strong ILTS reading score can significantly enhance your prospects. Universities often set specific IELTS band requirements for admission. For competitive programs, a band 9 can set you apart from other applicants. Many employers view a high ILTS score as a testament to your English language abilities. Excelling in the ILTS reading test equips you with valuable skills that extend beyond the exam itself. It enhances your ability to comprehend academic texts, research papers and professional documents. This can benefit your studies, research work and overall career progression. Achieving a band 9 in the ILTS reading test is about unlocking opportunities and thriving in an interconnected world. The ILTS reading test assesses your ability to understand written English across various contexts. It comprises three passages, each with a different theme and level of difficulty. The passages are taken from books, magazines, journals and newspapers. You'll encounter a variety of question types designed to test different reading skills. These include multiple choice questions, identifying information, true slash false slash not given, matching headings, sentence completion and more. Each question type requires a specific approach. Understanding the test format and question types is crucial for effective preparation. Familiarize yourself with the instructions, time limits and marking scheme for each question type. This familiarity will enable you to allocate your time wisely and approach each question strategically. Remember, the IELTS reading test is not a test of your general knowledge. It's about your ability to understand and interpret information presented in the passages. Focus on developing your reading comprehension skills rather than relying on prior knowledge. Skimming and scanning are essential reading techniques for navigating the IELTS reading test effectively. Skimming involves quickly glancing through the passage to grasp the main idea and overall structure. This helps you understand the context and identify relevant sections for specific questions. Scanning, on the other hand, involves searching for specific information such as keywords, dates or names. This technique helps you locate answers quickly without reading every word in the passage. To improve your skimming skills, Practice reading the first and last sentences of each paragraph to get a sense of the main points. For scanning, underline keywords in the questions and then search for those words or their synonyms in the passage. Mastering skimming and scanning techniques can significantly enhance your reading speed and efficiency, allowing you to answer questions more quickly and accurately. Section 4. Tackling Different Question Types each question type in the ILTS reading test requires a specific approach. For multiple choice questions, read the question and all the options carefully. Eliminate clearly incorrect options and choose the best answer. For true slash false slash not given questions, analyze the statement and compare it to the passage. True means the statement agrees with the information. False means it contradicts the information. Not given means the information is not mentioned. For matching headings, match the list of headings to the paragraphs. 
Skim each paragraph to identify its main idea. Choose the heading that best summarizes the paragraph. For sentence completion, understand grammar and vocabulary in context. Identify the missing word or phrase, scan the passage, and choose the word that fits grammatically and semantically. Section 5. Avoiding Common Pitfalls Many candidates make common mistakes in the ILTS reading test that can lower their scores. One common mistake is spending too much time on a single question. Remember that each question carries equal marks, so it's important to manage your time effectively. Another mistake is relying on general knowledge instead of focusing on the information presented in the passage. The ILTS reading test assesses your ability to understand written English, not your knowledge of a particular subject. Candidates also sometimes misinterpret questions or answer choices. Read each question and answer choice carefully, paying attention to keywords and qualifiers. If you're unsure of an answer, mark it and come back to it later if you have time. Finally, some candidates neglect to proofread their answers. Always double-check your answers for spelling, grammar and accuracy before submitting your test. Section 6. Practice makes perfect. The key to achieving a band 9 in the ILTS reading test is consistent practice. Familiarize yourself with the test format, question types and time constraints by taking practice tests regularly. Analyze your performance, identify your strengths and weaknesses and focus on improving your weaker areas. Read extensively in English from a variety of sources such as books, newspapers, magazines and online articles. This will not only improve your reading comprehension skills, but also enhance your vocabulary and grammar. When practicing, simulate the test environment as closely as possible. Time yourself, avoid distractions, and use official ELTS practice materials to get a realistic sense of the test experience. Remember, the more you practice, the more confident and prepared you'll feel on test day.